He says that the story was written rapidly, as if without thought. The work grew on my hands. So it's rather similar to that, 20, uh, that kind of 1920s modernist concept of automatic writing. So the work grew on my hands, as if the brain, the conscious mind, had nothing to do with the composition, that there was somewhere in the subconscious mind was actually articulating this story. So here is uh, J.K. Green's illustration of a, an 1840 dramatization of a tragedy. And this is for a, um, a balletta, a kind of, uh, basically a kind of uh, Victorian pantomime version of a trancer. So the Castle of Tranto, or Harlequin in the Giant Helmet. The first scene of a tranto deals with the destruction and death of uh, one Conrad, who's a prince, uh, in the Duchy of Otranto, which is ruled by a rather evil, uh, uh, evil fellow known as Manfred. So the prince is crushed by a gigantic helmet, and Freud and critics have made a great play with the kind of sexual symbolism of this moment. And this is a moment that Walpole dreamt of, of the man being crushed by the huge helmet. And this is how Walpole writes. A volley of voices replied, Oh, my lord, the prince, the prince, the helmet, the helmet, shot with these lamentable sounds, and dreading he knew not what, this is Conrad, he advanced hastily. But what a sight for a father's eyes. He beheld his child dashed to pieces and almost buried under an enormous helmet an hundred times more large than any ever made for human being and shaded with a proportionable quantity of black feathers. The horror of the spectacle took away the prince's speech. He touched, he examined the faithful cast, nor could even the bleeding, mangled remains of the young prince divert the eyes of Manfred from the portent before it. Uh, the critic David Daitchis wrote in the 1950s that of all the cultural pioneers in literary history, Otranto is the most foolish and <laughs> badly written. And whatever you think of it as a book, it is nonetheless very important for setting the tone of the Gothic novel. So it has a medieval setting. It has a Roman Catholic setting. It has a story where one sees fantastic plot development allied to the modern, and I mean 18th century modern, tradition of the realist novel. In other words, the early 18th century rise of the novel, introduced by Daniel Defoe <coughs> in his pioneering English novel, Robinson Crusoe, <coughs> 1719. So Walpole liked reading the modern novels of his day, because remember that the novel, the English novel, is less than 50 years old when he writes Otranto. So he liked reading Defoe and especially Fielding and Samuel Richardson, but he's also fascinated by medieval romance, all the stories he's reading in his Gothic library, such as Beowulf and, uh, and um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. So what he's doing, in effect, and he's quite explicit about this, is fusing two diverse literary forms, what he calls the ancient romance and the modern romance. Now, the ancient romance is perhaps uh, best exemplified by the medieval anonymous romance Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which was written somewhere between Cheshire and Somerset by we know not whom and we know not when, but it's plainly at some point in the late 14th century. And in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, we see the following story. So at the opening ceremony, King Arthur and his knights <coughs> of the Round Table and his lovely queen, Guinevere, are feasting because it is the time of Christmas and the New Year. And their revelries are disturbed by a gigantic green man, no less than eight feet high, who challenges the courage of the warriors of the round table. And he says to King Arthur, give me a blow, and I will give you a blow. In, 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 in other words, he's kind, of, um, he's kind of setting them a task 
he's challenging the bravery and valiance of the knights of the Round Table. So, one of the knights of King Arthur, Sir Gamma says, I will take this blow on your behalf. And he puts his head down, and the green knight, sorry, the, 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 the green knight puts his head down, and Sir Gawain lops his head off. And the knights of the Round Table think, well, that's the end of him, isn't it? But unfortunately not, because the, uh, the, the beheaded body picks up the head, which issues a challenge, say, right, Gawain, in a year's time, I will see you on my own castle, and I will deliver the same blow to your head as you did to mine. And various magical and remarkable things happen. Now, the one thing you can safely say about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is that it is not true. It's a fantastical... <laughs> safety jackets on. So, <coughs> we can reasonably say and assume that unless things, they order things differently in the 14th century, the castle of uh, um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is not a true story. But the tales told by Daniel Defoe, such as Robinson Crusoe, are based loosely on the realities of life and on stories which are true. So there is this air of verisimilitude, in other words, trueness to life in the 18th century novel. So what Walpole is doing is attempt, attempting to blend the two forms of romance. Remember, in the 18th century, novels were not called novels, they were called romances. Okay? By, the 19, by, the, by the turn of the 19th century, they're called novels. But Walpole says this, it was an attempt to blend the two kinds of romance, the ancient, in other words, medieval stories, and the modern i.e. the realist novel of Defoe, and in particular, Rich, uh, Richardson. So a fusion of medieval tales of enchantment, witch, uh, witchcraft and chivalry with the modern novel. So that's the very beginning of the Gothic novel in its attempt to make that which is improbable, implausible, supernatural, given a kind of tincture and appearance of trueness to life. So what are Gothic novels? Those of you who will study English at, univers at university will be well advised to buy Chris Baldick's Oxford Dictionary of Literary Terms, which is by far the best, um, Vardy Meckham, uh, the best, sort of the best dictionary and introduction to literary terms. So he says this, Gothic novel, a story of terror and suspense, usually set in a gloomy old castle or monastery, hence Gothic a term applied to medieval architecture and thus associated in the 18th century with superstition. And in particular, of course, Roman Catholic superstition in inverted commas. That's the kind of late 18th century English gentleman's opinion of Roman Catholicism. So Ruth Mack, in her book, Literary Historiography, published in 2009, says this. The most basic claim one might make about the Gothic, it is about the privileging of imagine over reason, terror over truth. So a preoccupation with terror. So let's tease out the early history of the Gothic novel. So in 1764, Walpole's book is published to great popular acclaim. The poet Gray, who wrote the, the uh, elegy written in the country churchyard, who was professor of Greek, at Cambridge University said that he was afeared to go to bed at night from reading The Castle of Atranta. So it's a popular success and it spawns a whole lot of imitators, as is always the way. If you have a particular genre then and it's successful, then people come in and copy you. Things are no different in the 18th century than they are today. So following the appearance of The Castle of Atranta, the Gothic novel flourished in Britain from the 1790s to the 1820s, dominated by Anne Radcliffe, Mrs. Radcliffe, the great enchantress, as she was known, whose mysteries of Adolfo had many imitators. She was careful to explain away the apparently supernatural occurrences in her stories, but other writers, such as Matthew Lewis in The Monk, made free use of ghosts and demons, along with scenes of cruelty and horror. And I'll say a little in a moment 
about the differences between these two brands of early Gothic, between Radcliffe Gothic and the Gothic of Matthew Gregory Lewis. And remember, Baldick says she explains away the supernatural events. And that's a crucial moment in looking at the development in the first 40 years of Gothic fiction. So Baldick says that, it's this, the fashion for such works contributed to the new emotional climate of romanticism. So romanticism, that um, uh, movement which challenged the orthodoxy of 18th century neoclassicism, is part and generated by Gothic, and it's fully part of it. In an extended sense, many novels that do not have a medievalized setting, but we share a comparably sinister, grotesque, or claustrophobic atmosphere have been classed as Gothic. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, 1818, is a well-known example. And there are many modern tales and novels with strong Gothic elements in this sense. So Gothic novels can take place in 21st century California as well as 14th century Tuscany. So that word, Gothic, has come to be associated with a whole bunch of emotional responses, fear, a kind of claustrophobic air of evil. So Gothic is part of the new emotional <coughs> climate of romanticism. And in a previous life, I say a few years ago, I was professor of romantic literature at this university. So let us have a kind of five minute version of romanticism, because Gothic is a key part of romantic, it seems to me. Okay, so romanticism is the literature of the period between 1789, the date of the French Revolution, and 1832, the date of the Reform Act introduced by Earl Grey, which of course is commemorated in Newcastle upon Tyne by Grey's Monument. And this period of literary history is generally associated with the so-called Big Six romantic poets. There are many other poets active as well, many women poets and labour class poets as well. But in, since the early 19th century, since English was uh, organised as a subject in universities from the University of London onwards, there has been this preoccupation with these six men, Wordsworth, Blake, Coleridge, Shelley, Byron, Keats. And their emphasis is upon creativity and the imagination. And in part, this is a revolt or reaction against the philosophical rationalism of Isaac Newton and John Locke. It's also a deeply radical political movement. Uh, the French Revolution is the master theme of our epoch. So it's politically radical. At the same time as thinking about nature and the imagination, about the Lake District, about the sea, about the river, about the waterfall, there is also an attention in Romanticism to the emotional province of the Gothic novel. So it's no surprising, it's no surprise that many of the greatest Gothic novels see a matter.